Okay, I'm going to um, welcome now our speaker, um, who is Daniel Schillingford. He's coming to share with us, um, particularly for the children, but he's come and um, we just want to welcome him. And ask, let's just come and pray for you. Okay, I hope you don't mind me saying this, Daniel, but I can actually tell you that his family and my family go back many, many years. Our fathers were friends together in the workplace in a Christian fellowship. And, um, you know, they've grown together, etc. and that. So we go back a long way. Yeah. And I hate to say this, but I can remember when he was a little boy. <laughs> I haven't seen him for a long time. So it's the first time I've seen him in a long time. But I do know his family very well. So, uh, yeah, yeah? It's good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Lord, we just want to give you thanks that um, Daniel has come to share the word this morning. Lord, we just ask that you would just bless him now with whatever he comes to share with us here at High Road. We welcome him, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you chose him even before he was born. You chose his father and his mother and the great ministry that they have within that family. And Lord, we just thank you that you, Daniel had made that choice at some point in his life, not just because his mother wanted him to or his father wanted him to, but he made the choice as a young man to serve you. And we just want to thank you, Lord, that Daniel is here this morning to share with us. So we ask that you just bless him as he speaks, Lord, and pray that as we receive the word from him, that we will be blessed too. Amen. 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 So I have quite a few links with the church. I led um, uh, 2020, which was like a regional uh, concert uh, for the Baptist LBA. And a lot of uh, your young people within this church um, played within that concert and were involved in that concert and stuff. And I um, did a lot of my youth ministry in Edmonton Baptist Church. So there's a lot of connection here. I've now moved over to City Gates Church, which was my home church when I was growing up. But I have strong links with the Baptist churches and their connection. So I'm going to pray. Well, I was already prayed over, but we're going to read the passage. And then we're going to launch into our sermon today because I really believe it will bless you and connect with you guys today. Is that okay? Is that good? Yeah. You can talk back to me. Don't worry. I'm used to an environment where people actually talk back or you could stare. There's no worries with that. It's the same response to me. Our assignment today is Luke 17, 11, and 19, and I'll read it to you, but you could keep yourself in the reference in this passage, because we want to be people of the word. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border of Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, go, show yourself to the priest. And on their way, they were cleansed. One of them, when they saw he was being healed, came back and praised God with a loud voice. He threw himself down at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Verse 17, Jesus answered, were there not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Or the others, as there no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner. And then he said to them, arise, go, your faith has made you well. My assignment today to you and the two titles I have today is one, an attitude of gratitude is what we want to have when we approach Jesus. In my particular work, in my field of work with young people, an attitude of gratitude is what we want to have when we engage with God. And this veneer of self-entitlement is ruining our relationship when we engage with God. And my other title today for you is this. In the response to the nine disciples, the nine with leprosy, they turned around and their attitude was this. Thank you, Jesus, but don't worry, I'll take it from here. Thank you, Jesus, for the healings, but don't worry, I personally will take it from here. And so my assignment today is to challenge these concepts, to challenge these understandings. 
And I'll do verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We'll flow it together. I hope you're ready, but we'll travel together and see what the Lord has to say to us about having an attitude of gratitude when we come to church. And one of the reasons why we're not breaking out in our relationship, one of the reasons why we're not engaging with God in the way we're doing it, because we feel entitled for blessings, entitled to be heard, entitled in our prayer life to be considered. But the question is, if Jesus died on the cross, is that, is that not more than enough for us? Or do we want to add on to his sacrifice and his commitment? Now, in my messages, I am confrontation, confrontational in nature, so you have to take me with a pinch of salt. But let's go into the passage. We see in verse 11, Jesus traveling to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the holy city, Jerusalem, where there's more wars, more violence, more arguments, where the three major religions congregate in Jerusalem. And Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem. And interestingly enough, in verse 4 to 9 in the book of Luke, you see Jesus in this area of Samaria and Galilee. What does that say to us? That say that Jesus never ventured out of these areas. That actually, personally, we might have a personal call to London, to Ilford, to this area. And this is so amazing. Without internet, without Twitter, without Instagram, without Snapchat, without uh, the news, without mass media, Jesus' message travelled all around the world. That is a phenomenon. Now, some of you guys are just like, oh, don't worry about that. That's not, actually for a peasant that his message would reach the rest of the world, he carried something significant. And so in the first passage, we see Jesus traveling on the borders, and he is now engaging. He was going to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the place of burial, the place of where he's going to be, the death, burial, and resurrection. He turns his eyes to Jerusalem. Luke writes this like a kind of movie writer. He stays in Galilee. He turns his attention to Jerusalem and says Jesus is heading to his ultimate destination, his ultimate goal, his ultimate place where God's going to use him. In verse 12, we see this. He travels, he gets sidetracked when he's traveling. He goes into the, a village, and ten men with leprosy stood from afar and shouted to Jesus, now, you might not really understand the, the, the implications for leprosy, but leprosy in the Bible's days were absolutely fatal. Leprosy was a disease that would numb your hands, that would discolor your face, that would parts of your face would actually peel off with leprosy. If you had leprosy, you had to rip your clothes, you had to shout from afar, unclean, unclean, unclean. If you had leprosy, you were more known for your disease than you, know, than you were known for being a person. Have you ever been around people who have terminal illnesses? Have you ever been around people who have diagnosis of cancer and all they're known for is Jane with cancer? Have you ever been in a position of suffering where your suffering almost engulfs you? In this passage, these men were only known for their leprosy, only known for what they see. Now, if you, I, I wouldn't suggest it, but if you ever see someone with leprosy, I worked with a minister who went in Tanzania, and in Tanzania there were still parts of leprosy colonies there, still parts of area that people had leprosy. Leprosy today now is known as um, um, Hansen disease. And now we have cures for that. And now it's curable. But in those days, it wasn't curable. In those days, they were completely outskirts. Have you ever been in a place where you walk with God where you feel far away from him? On the outskirts. That people look at you odd, peculiar. And this is what these men had. I don't know if you ever know about the story of the elephant man. And those of you of a certain age group might know the story of the elephant man, but elephant man was somebody who had a skin complaint where his skin and his bones would keep on growing, but it was supposed to stop. 
So now when we grow up as children, your mind and your body says, grow to this capacity and stop. The elephant man, his skin kept on growing and growing and growing, and hence he had a, a massive head. Now, in the Victorian days, yeah, thank you, kids. You learn, at least you're listening to me, yes. A massive head. He was called Elephant Man because he looked peculiar. And what they used to do was put him in a circus, and people used to go up to him, and they used to look at him, and they used to go, ah! They used to actually make noises when they saw him, because he looked so disfigured. The Elephant Man was a laughing stock. Hence, there was a man that came up to him who was a medical doctor and said to him, I want to take you in and look after you. He saw the elephant man as an experiment. He saw the elephant man as a project. As he spoke to the elephant man, he saw the humanity in him. He saw that he was human, that he was a person, and he began to talk and talk to him. And people from aristocrats, people who are wealthy, people who are doctors, people who are prime, not prime ministers, but MPs came and visit him. And the elephant man was known more for his intellect than what he looked like. Although the men with leprosy didn't have the same disease as the elephant man, as I watched the play, I could relate to being on the outskirts. I could relate to the need, the pain of the elephant man. Well, the elephant man used to sleep with his head forward because his head was so large. His feet was forward, head forward. And then one day, the elephant man was tired. Tired of what? Tired of never being engaged. Tired of never really having a meaningful relationship. Tired that he was never seen as human. Well, the elephant man decided to sleep like a human would sleep. And he tipped his head back and laid back in his bed, and then he died. He died because he, the, the windpipe asphyxiated and his head was too heavy. He died because he wanted to be human. I submit to you, just to relate to these lepers, they wanted to be human again. There are people in our communities that we're not touching. There are people that we see that we walk on the other side of the road. There are people who need the gospel and we see them a particular way. And Jesus died for everybody. And I want you to know, how do you perceive and see people? Do you see them as an elephant man? Or do you have the compassion like Jesus did, to touch those that won't be touched, to reach those that are unreachable, to reach those in society that others will forget. Will you have the heart for them? Or will you judge them and leave them? And so, in essence, in truth, that's the first passage. They weren't included in the society. Interesting enough, these men who had leprosy could go into a synagogue, but they had to be six feet away from the normal people. They were sons, they were daughters, they were part of a community, but they were on the outskirts. In those days, leprosy was seen as a spiritual condition as well. How do we know that? Well, we know that Miriam, when she spoke against Moses and the leaders, she was striked with leprosy. So they thought leprosy was a condition of a choice. They also felt from Naaman, that Naaman in the book, in the Old Testament, was judged as a foreigner, and because he wasn't part of the kingdom, he had leprosy. So leprosy was this, a physical, emotional, social um, separation from God. Now you might say to me, why am I pressing this point with you? I want you to know that Jesus stretched out to people physically, emotionally, and also economically separated from God. Can you relate to Jesus' passion to relate to those people? And so we see this in the passage. Now we see in verse 11, stood from afar, we see these guys shout from a distance. I want you to know, in verse 5 in Luke, Jesus went up to a man who had leprosy, and a man with leprosy turned around and said to him, if you're willing, you can make me well. And Jesus heals him. In this passage, 
from far away, Jesus heals him. What does that say to us? It says this. God can reach you close and personal, and he can reach you when you're far away and distant. There is no reach. You, there is no situation you'll find yourself that God can't reach. Amen? Amen. 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 So he reaches out to us, the untouchables, those in societies that won't be touched. He turns around and says, show yourself to the priest. Now I want to talk about being grateful. Showing yourself grateful. For the kids, there's a story about the ungrateful lion. And it goes something like this, kids. If you stay with me. There was an ungrateful lion. And he was walking in the forest. And he was absolutely hungry. Famished. Needed something to eat. He was walking in the forest. He see bamboo sticks. And he saw a piece of meat within the bamboo sticks. And this lion was so hungry, he ran into the, uh, in between his bamboo sticks. And he jumped on the meat and he started to eat. But lo and behold, the trap fell on him. The lion turns around. And he screams, help me, help me, as he's t uh, walking around to and fro inside his bamboo sticks. Well, a man passed by. He was a kind of animal rights type of character. Oh, you don't know those individuals. Well, <laughs> he was one of those. As he was walking by, he had compassion on the lion. He came up to the lion and he opened him from the trap. The lion turned around and said, thank you so much, and you will be my next dinner. <laughs> the man was like, whoa, 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 didn't I just help you? How can you want to eat me? The lion turned around and says, well, I was hungry, and you look absolutely delicious. The man said, whoa, okay, before you eat me, before you devour me, before you take me to pieces, I think we need an independent judge. The lion said, what are you talking about? You're the king of the jungle. And I think you must be fair on these issues. So the lion goes, oh, I'll pity you. Who would you like to see? A jackal walked by. And he goes to the jackal. Um, the lion goes, come over, jackal. This man thinks what I'm going to do to him is unfair. The jackal says, tell me what happened. And so the, the lion goes, well, what happened was I was really hungry and I walked into the cage and the jackal goes, why don't you walk into the cage? So the lion walks into the cage, inside this cage, showing what happened. And the jackal pulled the lever and shuts the door on the lion. <laughs> and you say to yourself, what has that got to do with anything? The moral of the story, when the jackal said to the lion was this, you were ungrateful. That ultimately, when it came to compassion... You were ungrateful that you were going to be eaten, but now that you were set free, you showed no compassion. How many of us in church, you were pulled out of darkness into the marvelous light, and those who are dealing with issues, you showed no compassion to? Oh, sorry, did I step on your toes? Oh, pardon me. I'll go again. How many of us have been brought out of the darkness, and now you're in the marvelous life, you show no compassion? No compassion. In the time of need, the lion turned, but he forgot. And the jackal said, you deserve what you deserve. No compassion. And I'm talking about a heart full of compassion like Jesus did. I want to tell you another story to base it in reality. A Baptist minister spoke to me about a time of need. He was a Baptist minister for over 25 years. He loved his church. He loved his community. He loved his leaders. He loved, his, he, he christened them, he did marriage for them, he also um, prayed for them, where their family members were terminally ill, he stood with them, he was supporting them. In his time of need, his son got caught up in drugs, and his son came into the church. Now, he wasn't abusing anyone, but his son was clearly a drug dealer. Have you seen a drug dealer before? they got a certain disposition about themselves, very pale, and he looked very nervous. They had a meeting, a church meeting, to see if the pastor had any vote of confidence to continue to lead the church. You know what a vote of confidence is? That the church decided that because the pastor was allowing his son to come into the church and he was a drug dealer or he was on drugs, that he was unfit to lead. Are you still with me? He's unfit to lead. This pastor 
in his pain, said, but I led half of this church to salvation. This pastor, in his concern, said, I baptized their children. This pastor, in his pain, said, would they show mercy when mercy was due? In the church meeting, they were there. And they were going to vote whether he should be still the pastor of the church. And one woman stood up, full of compassion, and said this, Although the son is on drugs, our pastor cared for us, he looked after us, he loved us. And yes, maybe he shouldn't be coming to the 11 o'clock service where there's children. And maybe he should go to the 6 o'clock service where it's more appropriate. But the reality is, we must be compassionate like Jesus is. Can you see the heart of gratitude in the life of believers? This pastor in the end kept his job because the congregation remembered that they were supposed to be merciful like he showed mercy. Question we place, are you truly merciful to those who need mercy? Or do you judge those forgetting that you yourself deserves mercy? I know it's confrontational this morning. I know I'm in your face this morning. But sometimes when God gives you a message, you've got to share it. Whether I be liked or disliked, whether I be invited again, it is the word of God. And we need people today that will speak his message, regardless of how you feel. Oh, well, while we're in that vein, in that attitude, to make sure we're not afraid of what people think, and we have to encourage the attitude of compassion. Well, in verse 15, we see this guy who has leprosy and he was a Samaritan, a double whammy. Now, Samaritans were half Brit or half Jewish and something else. And Jewish people almost despite that actually hated Samaritans. You know the story of the Good Samaritan? This is a progression of that story. And so they hated Samaritans. This man, the only man that came back, the only one who returned, the only one who decided to praise God returned back a Samaritan. In today's society, if I could reframe the story, it was this. It, Luke, shall we reframe it for you? A Muslim who, what, who had leprosy got healed and was the only one that came back to praise God. Now your eyes pop out your head. It's a reframing of the social norms that were in the time. It was only him that came back to praise God. Do you understand what a Samaritan means to Jewish people? No way. Samaritans, they don't know Jesus. But sometimes the hand of God reaches those that you won't touch. The hand of God reaches those that you will, will not believe will be touched. This man falls at the feet of Jesus and says thank you. Interesting enough, as I draw this message to a close, the nine absolutely get destroyed in this passage because they don't come back to praise God. And we think to yourself, if you got that kind of healing, you would return, wouldn't you? If you had leprosy, the leprosy I described, that you would return. But the nine did what God asked them to do. Jesus said, show yourself to the priest. The nine and the ten went into church or went into this church environment and told their testimony to the church leader. But what they did and where they went wrong, they did not give glory to God. And I want to press this one to you. This, and I press this story. I remember being doing a prayer meeting with a guy who wanted a job. We prayed, we prayed, we prayed. This guy actually got his job. And then I said to him, after six months, we haven't seen you at the prayer meetings. He goes, well, your prayer meeting is on Monday night. My, uh, we finish work at 7.30. And to be honest with you, your prayer meeting starts at 8. And I'm too tired to come to the prayer meeting. Now, I'm not here to condemn you, nor to step on your personal toes. But the reality was... He was happy to tell me and to praise God for the answer of the miracle. But he wouldn't come in personally 
and tell people what God has personally done for him. How many times have I asked people to come and share your testimony and they go to me, Daniel, I'm not a public speaker. Public speaking is not my gifting. Why don't you tell it? No, it's not my testimony. It is yours. A grateful heart says, actually, I must go back to God and give him the glory personally. Does that make any sense to you? So what happened was the nine did what was asked, but they left and never gave thanks. This one Samaritan, this one Muslim, if you want to put it across like that, came back and said, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God. I want us to live as a corporate church. Are you pointing to God through your life? Are you saying glory to God through your life? Are you now not stealing the testimonies that you should be sharing due to the fact because of your weaknesses and you feel that you shouldn't be doing it. I want you to know this. God demands glory. And he wants glory from his people. And I draw this to a close as I press this button. To be grateful, you are celebrating 200 years of Sunday school or more. Are you truly grateful for what God has done in this church? I am grateful what God is doing in Baptist churches. Over 400 years, the Baptist church has been placed in this country. Are you truly grateful for what God has done? Or do you do this? Actually, Father, I'll take it from here. Actually, Jesus, I'll take it from here. Thank you for the money. Thank you for the house. Thank you for the home. But I'll take it from here. Are you had the attitude of, I'll take it from here, or are you truly grateful? If Jesus does nothing more for you, are you grateful? Church, are you really grateful? Yes. Or are you asking this question, I want more? More from your God, more. More, but actually Jesus is saying, the little I give, you should be grateful. I don't know if you know this song. And maybe you might be able to help me to do that as I draw it to a close. But if you don't hear this one, give thanks with a grateful heart. You know, give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given his son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks unto the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ. And now, and now, let the weak say, let the poor say, because of what? For thank you for listening.